So um, each morning, I've shared this before, I have what I call a scripture jar, and I choose a scripture that I focus and meditate on today. And so the one I had for today was about going into all the world and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things. And I don't um, I, I just kept thinking about our mis- mission and, well, our purpose statement that says we, are, we want to be disciples who make disciples, who live and love like Jesus. And if that's too much to remember, just remember, live and love like Jesus. That's what we need to do. Focus on that. In this series, we are focusing on the characteristics that we need to have um, in order to do unto others as God has told us to. But the really interesting thing is that for living and loving like Jesus, then we need just to look and know Jesus and know how Jesus lived. And then if we do the same thing, people will see those traits in our hearts and the way we treat each other. So today we're going to focus on being humble. Let's begin with prayer. Uh, Lord, today... Reveal to us in a powerful way how Jesus demonstrated humility and how he related to others. Teach us to walk humbly with you and to humbly respond to those we meet so that we might truly find unity in you. Amen. So humility is an interesting word. Um, It's a word that comes from the Latin word humilis, and it's the idea where we actually get words like human, and humanity is from that same word, and also humor. And I thought, humor, interesting. But think about it. When we tell a joke, it's kind of like sometimes we can laugh at ourselves. We can just see ourselves when we do things good, but when we mess up. Um, but, but even that has some kind of, if it's good humor, it's kind of this sense of um, understanding ourselves as humans. Um, in our world, and especially even in the Roman Greek time, humanity, I mean, sorry, humility was not seen as a virtue. It was often seen as a weakness. Someone's passive, weak. We think of the word humiliated, um, shamed. It was used in a negative sense, but that's not how the Bible uses it. Okay, in Genesis, the second chapter, we learn that the Lord God formed the first human from The word actually means topsoil, humus, of the fertile land. And he blew life's breath into his nostrils. Okay? Um, Every graveside service I do, and at Ash Wednesday, we say, um, we always say this phrase, from dust we came, and to dust we shall return. So we are all created by God on the same ground level as everyone else who is created by God. And remembering this helps us to focus on relationships with one another rather than having that sense of that we need to prove we're better or someone's worse than us. So I have been appointed a pastor here for over 12 years, amazingly, praise God. Um, And so I still get interesting, though, reactions when I tell someone, especially outside of our church, I'm a pastor. I actually try to avoid that a little bit. Um, because when I say pastor, people some have this image of like someone who is holier than thou. <laughs> that they had the whole Bible memorized. That they know how to do every, uh, they know how to, um, you know, solve every single problem in the church. And they have in the Methodist church, um, we have every paragraph memorized of the book of discipline. <laughs> right, Kathy? No. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. This book is that thick. Um, And so people have this idea, oh, they're a pastor. So I've shared this before. They either uh, start telling you all their sins and confessing, or they avoid you, okay? But that's not, it's interesting. When I look at myself as a pastor, I'm in awe that God would take somebody ordinary like me. I am an ordinary person. I've even said that. When someone says, oh, you're the pastor. And I'm like, it's okay. I was an ordinary person for most of my life. This is second career. I'm still ordinary. I make mistakes. I foul up. Sometimes I, I, I try to do it right, but I, I, I do. I sin and I ask forgiveness. Um, there's days when I am full of joy and thanksgiving, and other days I, grape, I, I need another cup of coffee and I'm grumpy. Where's Randy? Amen. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to behave myself. 
you're doing really good, okay? But I'm human, and I try to be human with people, and, I, and, I, and that is what I want to be, because I know anything good in my life comes from God. God has worked in me, he's forgiven me, and he uses me, and he's called you and gifted you and created you to use your gifts as well. So it's important. It's, it's all about the goodness of God's grace. So why is it important to be humble? Well, here's some reasons. First reason, it's about our relationship with God, okay? Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The idea of walking with God humbly means living your life with God every moment, not just on Sundays, not just when you're in a church group, but every moment you're walking with God. Jesus puts it a different way. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, I am humble. You are to be humble, right? We're to be yoked Yoked is a fancy word that we don't use very often anymore. It means to be connected. Um, In the past, two oxen were pulling um, the plow in the field, and they would have a wooden uh, piece of wood that would connect them together so that one didn't walk ahead of the other. Okay, they worked together. One didn't have to do it alone. Both of them contributed and were able to do more. It's a great illustration of how we walk with God and walk with Jesus, that we are connected, if we agree to stay connected to Jesus, um, that Jesus helps us to pull that load of life. And, and together, um, we find rest because we're not doing it alone, right? Okay, so yoke is that relationship we have with God. So we have to stay together, follow Jesus' lead, and then um, we'll find that peace and rest. Um, so what does this look like in our world? Okay, so here we go. I'm w- meeting with people in the public, and I come across someone, and it actually happened last week, and the person's just going on and on about some political person uh, going off on stuff, and my first reaction was to shut him up. I don't want to hear all that. That's my human side, okay? I don't want to hear that. I'm just going to go. I'm just going to leave. And I felt like I needed to talk to God. So I'm kind of in the middle of listening thinking about being yoked with Jesus. Um, Jesus, what do I do with this person? I love them, I do, but I really don't want to get into an argument. And I felt like Jesus was saying to me, just love them. Just listen, share from your heart, and just let me work through you. And that's what I did. Sometimes it means redirecting. If someone's arguing and they've just got to prove that you're wrong and they're right, you can say, you know what, I know we're disagreeing. We, you know, we can agree to disagree, but how's your mom doing? Or how's, how's work going? You know, you redirect. I do that with children when I was a teacher. Um, but I, I don't have to be mean. I don't have to argue. I don't have to be nasty. I can love them and treat them as they are the same value as me before God. And so that's about our relationship with God, but it's also about unity. Unity is not uniformity. For some of you, um, you know, some people, they say, well, I I don't want to have anything to do with you because you're not like with me. But that's Jesus' way was not that way. Unity is about a relationship, not thinking exactly the same. Jesus prayed for us to have this unity in John 17, He begins with addressing his disciples, but then he goes on to say, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me. Listen carefully. This is what Jesus prayed. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Wow. And then Jesus says, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. 
Unity is very important to God. Jesus prayed for that, but it only comes through humility, yielding our need to be right to the greater need for us to learn how to be in relationship with one another. If the world can see how that love connects us across differences, then they will know, they'll say, I want that love in my life. I want to know, I want to be a part of that community. I, I want others to truly know God's ex unconditional love. And that brings us to our scripture today in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, which teaches us what we believe should be evident in our actions. In chapters one through, uh, the first, or th first through third chapters of Ephesians, um, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul is laying out who you are in Christ, um, doctrine about what we believe, about the Holy Spirit, about salvation. And then he gets to chapter four and he shifts. And so now you know who you are in Christ. This is how you, what you do if you are in Christ. And so as we read, he talks about the actions. How do we treat each other um, and do that? Um, we can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and honestly, it's really hard. Christians try. So I run into this every week. <laughs> There's people on this side. You need to read this translation. You need to believe this. You need to do it this way. You should go to this church. If you don't do that, you are definitely not connected to God. Right belief is everything. And then there's people on this side. Well, I don't really care about all that. I think we should just be nice to each other. I think we should just do our best and love each other. I should be kind to each other. But I don't really care about church. I don't care about God. They're all hypocrites. In the middle, that purple middle, <laughs> we need to know the belief about God because we're going to miss out on what God's love and his life for us if we don't know what we are to believe because what we believe changes us, right? What we believe about Jesus Christ, that he came, that we might have life to the full, that he died for us, that changes who we are and changes our attitude. It's hard to be prideful in, in our life if we know that God, in God's grace, saved us and God reached out to us and loved us. Right belief matters, but right actions matter. If we say we believe that, we gotta do it. We need to live it. We need to love others. People of the world is looking at us. We need to come together and say, yes, what I believe is why I love and act the way I do. It's why I can forgive. It's why I can be respectful and patient and kind and all those words we use because of Jesus Christ and what God's done for me. We can do this. I believe it. <laughs> so when we do that, we, what are some simple ways to do that? Here's three things. Listen. Jesus was a good listener. We have story after story where Jesus talked to people in the temple, along the road, um, as he went to their homes and ate together. He listened. He talked and he listened. We know he listened because he asked a lot of questions. He was curious. Um, there's over 100 questions in the New Testament where Jesus asked a question. Okay, so maybe you've heard some of these. Why are you afraid? Who do you say that I am? What is written in the law? How do you read it? What are you looking for? What can I do for you? Jesus was always interacting with others in a humble way. When you're curious, you're saying, I don't know all the answers. I don't know everything about you. I want to know more. Listening is not to find something to then beat somebody up with it. I've known people that call that listening. But real listening is listening to understand, to understand, asking questions. This makes a way for peace. We, are, we, um, we tend to be negative towards people when we don't understand. When we're fearful, we don't understand. So peace brings, understanding brings peace. Okay, and then humility also leads to see our neighbor as people loved by God. They're not a position. They're not a box with a label to say, you're one of those, or you're one of these, and so you're all do that, and you think this. No, we're people, we're complex. We may agree with some things, and other things we're very different. 
Okay, so it's important to listen and not put people in boxes. Um, Jesus got it. Tax collectors, um, he, fishermen, he would jump in the boats of fishermen, eat with sinners. He would do, talk to the woman at the well in a time when men didn't talk to women like that. Um, he had conversations he loved. He didn't separate himself out from them, but he invited them to know God. And then third, we endure with love. In the word, the passage, we sometimes see it bearing with one another in love. Bearing's hard. That's persevering. It's enduring. It's feeling discomfort at times because that person thinks differently than me. But we keep on loving. We don't give up. We persevere. And the good news is God helps us in the Holy Spirit. Paul gets this. He was in a time when the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, they didn't get along. They would look at each other. You're not doing the right practices, the Jewish um, believers would. And the Gentiles are like, yeah, and you're hypocritical and whatever. And, and Jesus and Paul was trying to get them to see it's, it's about one faith, one baptism, one Lord. Um, and so he tried to bring them together to focus on them, what it is most important. So what does this look in like in a culture, in a, in a family um, if we have someone we they don't agree with, we are not afraid to have those conversations and listen and love. I love that Proverbs states, as an iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As you are in those relationships, God can use that to clarify what you believe and then also help you to become more like Jesus. It's like sanding paper, okay? It sharpens you. Um, and then living and loving like Jesus... We look at Jesus. He was the ultimate example of humility. He humbled himself to death on the cross. He was brought low so that we could know God. We would have peace with God. In Philippians 2, 5, it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's what humility is. So what does it mean to have, be a humble church? Okay, I, ha I love this. So being a humble church means we value the ways God gifts each of us. We let others use their gifts, and we don't have to feel like ours. It means because they're good at something, it doesn't mean we're bad at something. It just means, wow, God has brought all of us together to use our gifts, and that's good. It means that um, we uh, don't care about if people know Brook Hill. It's not making our name famous. It's about making Christ known, right? And then it's about helping people. And they have an idea to support them and using their idea to serve and help others. It means we work together as a team and we forgive each other when we mess up. We're not better. We're all loved by God. Okay, I love this verse. It's been on my heart all week. Colossians 1, 6 says, This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. I love this verse because it talks about because you were changed, God's now using us to change the world. So I had this aha uh, moment this week when I was looking on Facebook late at night. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that, but I was. Facebook memory, 11 years ago. Luke Miller, and some of you know Luke because he spoke here a few months ago. Um, Luke was with my son, graduated from Messiah College, and this was in August of 2015 when he was getting ready to get married to Alyssa. And he wrote this on Facebook, and I have to tell you, it just really blew me away. He wrote, Let's rebuild a reality of God's presence, a church where our anointing isn't for us but for others, a place where our worship isn't for us but for our Creator, a culture who realizes that God has given us what it takes to reach the nations of the world. That's the church I would be excited about. It's time to wake up. So I text Luke, and of course it's 12 hours or so difference in Thailand. When he wrote that, he had no idea he was going to be a missionary in Thailand. No idea. And yet God was calling him to take the message of Christ to the world. 
He told me, and some of you prayed for him, him and Alyssa and their family got back to Thailand. Their home's okay with the floods. The camp they had planned for 180 youth from abandoned homes, orphanages, and uh, they call it aftercare centers, came together for camp and heard the gospel. And, you know, it was a wonderful time of sharing Christ. And he said, yeah, and the next week we're getting ready to do another camp of another 180 students. We're almost, we're limited at the camp by how many we can have at one time. And I thought about that. This is so not about who they are. It's about what God's doing in them. We need to wake up. In that place where they serve, people don't worry about which denomination you're in. They don't worry about which version of the Bible. There's Hindus, there's uh, Buddhists, there's all kinds of beliefs. They just, they just share about Jesus changing their heart and sharing the good news of Christ with those they meet. That's what I want us to do. I want us to build bridges of love, not walls to keep people away. I want us to get to know our, co- our co-workers, our neighbors, people in our lives. I want to show them that we can walk humbly with God. Some of you have been doing this for a long time, and I am in awe of your gifts that you love and care and serve. We've seen it over and over again. We have a lot of new people, and some of you may be here, that um, you, God has brought you here for a reason. We want to get to know you. I hope you'll stay after for the luncheon, or at least call me, because you have gifts. God had a reason for you being here. And maybe this morning, um, we've, uh, do- we baptized Abram Perez. Maybe there's someone here that needs to take that step and be baptized and be a part of our church officially. And so together, we are the Team Jesus We're going to walk and love and serve. And God is walking with us. And I can't wait to see how God's going to use us to reach Frederick and the world through him. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for humbly coming down to earth to show us what real love is all about. Teach us to be a humble church that shows others how to live and love like Jesus We want the world to look look at us and say, I want to be a part of this community. They live out what they believe. It isn't easy. It's hard. Give us courage to listen and seek unity as we build those bridges of love across our differences. We ask all of this in your name, believing you can do more than we can ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen.